Hello BookTube! I've taken on the maddening prospect of going through every video that I've ever made and talking about all the books that I mentioned. I guess this is a product of the insanity of quarantine, but <laughs> I'm gonna roll with it. So we are, this is TBR, TBR, that's what I'm calling them, and this is number five out of probably a thousand that we have to do. <laughs> we are still in March of 2016. And I've been going back and looking, one of you very patiently explained to Grandpa Simpson how I could arrange my videos from oldest to newest instead of newest to oldest. So that it was no longer a question of me going back and back and back and back and back trying. I could instead make it so that the oldest ones were first. That was invaluable. This couldn't happen without that. And I've been sifting through those older videos to get lists of books. All the books that I mentioned to go at them critically. Of course, it's had side effects as well, because those older videos have my old girls in them, my, my two older dogs. Uh, you're all familiar with Frida, my, my little miniature schnauzer who's, who's asleep behind me right now. Uh, but those older videos have my girls, in, and it's so halting, it's so arresting to see them, to see my beautiful Malin Moore and my sweet little hippo Lucy, my little basset hound. Uh, it's so... It's so amazing when you have the time, when you have the distance of time, you look back and I suddenly see them in a way that I did not see them when I was making those videos. I remember how I thought of them when I was making those videos. But now I look back and I see how old they were, how sick they were. I see, I see Lucy on my lap in videos and she's all white, just entirely white. You can look at Malin and see how much trouble she has moving around and how difficult either one of them, how much difficulty either one of them has seeing clearly. And, and I and myself in the videos am talking a little softer because I'm worried about alarming them or disturbing them. <laughs> that, those side effects are really weird. Um, but I called together a few more books from a few more videos. I'm just going to move incrementally forward. So I'm, we'll, we'll talk a little about the, video, the books that I have listed today and I will list them down below. And at the end we'll give the bean of the patch. We'll give the best of the one that sticks out in my memory. So the, the, I think I remember that we begin with a blast of fiction. Yes, Improbable Fortunes by Jeffrey Price, um, which uh, made it a, a semi-strong impression on me at the time, but has since faded. I, the more I think about it, the more I realize its flaws. So uh, the, the next one is As Close to Us as Breathing by Elizabeth Polliner, about a group of family that, that uh, gathers together in coastal Maine and deals with a tragedy. And it, uh, it occurred to me when I was looking at that older video that I've never seen a paperback of this book and I would love to reread it. I just, in, in the glory days of 2019, I would just complacently wait for the publisher to send me a paperback and they often don't. They often don't. Either because the paperback belongs to a different publicist or because the publicist that it belonged to, maybe the same publicist is dealing with the hardcover and the paperback, but leaves the publisher and goes elsewhere. And in the chaos, no one updates the lists or whatever. There are quite a few paperbacks that I don't get. I've heard, and I've heard this from other, from I, those of you who are brand new to the channel. Uh, I am a, a book reviewer. I'm a, a professional book critic. And I've heard from a number of, of my fellow critics that they don't keep track of the paperbacks. And so they could be blurbed on ten times as many books as they think they are. Certainly that has always surprised me when I used to go out and about to uh, the Harvard Bookstore and over in Cambridge. Uh, has, a, has a big, generous new releases in paperback table, and I used to go at that table when I would have a critic friend in town. We would look at the table together to see who was blurbed on what, and I was always surprised at how many blurbs of mine were there that I had not received the paperback for, had received no notice from the publisher. Uh, so I, I haven't had a paperback of this uh, Polliner book, and so I haven't reread it, but I, it stands out in my memory very strongly, as does the next one, The Association of Small Bombs by Karan Mahayan, uh, about two boys who are caught in, a, in an explosion, in, an, in a terrorist explosion in a city, and the different paths of their lives, the way that that uh, warps the path of their life. A tremendous book. This, this author I really, really like, and, uh, and if I seem to remember that he, I did see a paperback of this book. That had no blurb by Steve, but a blurb by somebody named Sam Sachs of the Wall Street Journal. Fairly good judge of uh, horseflesh when it comes to contemporary po uh, fiction. Uh, and then uh, there's a nonfiction work, Stand By Me by Jim Downs, uh, a story about the gay liberation movement, fairly competent, a little bit short. Uh, Emily Dickinson's Poems as She Preserved Them, edited by Christiane Miller, uh, which I, I liked well enough, but I think it's mainly for. Uh, Dickinson fans. Um, 
some book. I mean, in every in every publishing season, there are going to be about ten Emily Dickinson books, and I would say in every publishing season, about eight of those ten books will be for fans, for Emily Dickinson obsessives is what I what I tend to call them, uh, and that only two will be for other people. These fevered days, for instance is a, a fragmentary, very prismatic, recent book on Emily Dickinson that I kind of thought would be only for fans, but it wasn't. It was tremendously good for the general reader. Uh, this particular book is much more an archivist romp. It's much more for Emily Dickinson fans. If you are one, then I, I recommend it. But if, I, if you are one, you'll already have it. So, uh, then Eruption uh, by Steve Olson, a nonfiction work about the eruption of Mount St. Helens, a gigantic natural disaster that I watched unfold and was I have been fascinated about it ever since uh, the the book is fantastic it's the kind of informative scientifically literate nonfiction that you just love to read Olson starts off right away with a great observation that I forgot people had made at the time uh, which is that Mount St. Helens erupted on a Sunday and that if it erupted uh, at the same time on a Monday then 10,000 people would have died which is kind of amazing <laughs> you, you always think about variables like that i do anyway i always think about variables like that like for instance the planes that hit the twin towers on on september 11th if they had struck an hour later would have killed 10 times as many people and we would god only knows <laughs> what that would be like in the american mind it, it 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 random stuff like that just just fascinates me and it also all it also fascinates me that there were a whole bunch of specialists who were crawling all over mount st helens in the days and weeks leading up to the eruption because they knew perfectly well that something catastrophic might be happening. And a couple of them died right there in at ground zero, so to speak, uh, just vaporized. Uh, and, and Olson's book is terrific. I reviewed it. Um, but again, I'd never, never seen the paperback, so I don't know if I'm blurred on it or not. I hope I am, but you never know. I, I've reviewed a few of these things. Uh, like for instance, the next one, Far and Away by Andrew Solomon, which is a collection of his, uh, travel writing that is very very good had the uh the weird decision to have the dust jacket for the for the hardcover had a picture of him as a young man as a, almost a boy on the cover which was very interesting and served a good immediate visceral visual purpose of reminding us that a lot of this was young man impressions i really like the book again i've never seen the paperback never seen a hardcover again so uh, i think i reviewed it but i uh if i if i remember i will try to find links and leave them down below for any appropriate links, but I, I do recommend it either way. Uh, then we had, uh, oh, we have a batch of used books then uh, to finish this out. We had uh, the Norton Critical Edition of the Writings of St. Paul, Norton Critical Editions. I still get the new ones in the mail, or at least I used to. Uh, they have the, the source material, the original, the canonical stuff at the beginning, and then they have critical reactions for the second half of the book, or slightly less than the second half if the original book is very big. And uh, they're terrific, absolutely terrific. They're, they're, the original work is footnoted, heavily footnoted throughout the initial reading experience. There's usually a good introduction as well. And then there are dozens of essays that are just fascinating, a million different viewpoints on the work that you just read. And then there are usually endnotes in a bibliography. They're just a one course thing for studying some work of literature. And this volume on St. Paul is really, really good. I checked and I do not still own it. I must have sent it to one of you. I didn't think the book sending was happening in 2016, but I guess it's, it's possible that somebody came here for a night of wine and calzones and just liked it and asked if they could have it. I just don't remember it. That could easily be true, but I don't have it anymore. I have a shelf of Norton Criticals, but I don't have that one. Uh, then The Boilerplate Rhino by David Quammen, the great nature writer, David Quammen. The Boilerplate Rhino is a collection of his essays, not to be missed. His books are incredibly good. They have been right from the beginning, right from natural acts and whatnot. They've, they've been just, his collections of essays are incredible. And of course his sustained works are also incredible. The one that's getting everyone's attention is Spillover, a book that he wrote, um, what, eight or nine years ago about, uh, viruses that cross over from the animal world to the human world. And in that book, he predicts that Human, humanity is going to have to face these and that sooner or later one of them is going to be easily communicable and it's going to spread all over the world like wildfire because it will have there will be no uh, herd immunity among humans they'll never have encountered it before in his book he specifically targets the growing m market for bush meat for so-called bush meat where humans go out into the wilderness and kill anything that's alive in order to cook it and eat it even if no human has ever eaten it before 
a perfect way to introduce n n new pathogens into the human world. Spillover is would be very difficult to read now. I'm glad I don't have a copy of it, but I don't have a copy of Boilerplate Rhino either, and I wish I did. Uh, then Original Sin by the great P.D. James uh, about <clears throat> murder at a small publishing house in England. Just terrific. Just an amazing. One of my favorite P.D. James novels. I don't remember uh, if I reviewed it. I do have a literary connection with P.D. James. I think I reviewed one of her later books for somebody. But I also wrote her obituary, which is a weird thing to do. It's a weird thing to do for an author. I wrote her obituary for the Washington Post. <laughs> that, was, that was very strange. And I don't even know if I could link to that. I, I will try to remember to leave all these links. But I'm, I'm assuming that all of you know by now, that all of you are house trained enough by now to know that if I, if I say, that if you're interested in whether or not I have written about an author or a book, just search for it yourself using Google, if I forget, because I've written about an enormous amount of things in my life, an enormous amount. And I, it's not always easy for me to remember, and I, even when it is, it's not always easy for me to remember to add the annotations to a video. If you find such a thing and you think it's of interest, feel free to leave the link in the comments if I don't. Uh, but I feel certain that I have reviewed P.D. James. It wasn't Original Sin, because I don't think I was reviewing when this book came out. Boy, is it good, though. Uh, but it, I, I feel certain that I reviewed something of hers, or am I confusing her with Ruth Rendell? Did I maybe review a Ruth Rendell? A late Ruth Rendell? Or maybe both. <laughs> I know that I wrote her obituary. That's, that's that, anyway. Uh, and then the last one is Who Killed Classical Music? Uh, by Norman Lebrecht, who uh, posits in this book all the different the different commercial forces that are going into making classical music. First, the preserve of a very small niche of audience people, unlike what it was, for instance, in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, but also then moving on from that niche to make that niche so small that the whole thing is unsustainable. Brilliant insider commentary on the world of classical music uh, by a guy who wrote a column for Open Letters Monthly, the literary journal where I was uh, the managing editor for 10 years. And Norman Lebrecht had a column in almost every one of our issues. It was a delight to read them. Delight to see them go out into the world. Uh, and that is it. That is TBR, TBR number five. <laughs> uh, and all I have to do is pick the bean of the batch. And there can't be any choice here except Original Sin by P.D. James. It, it, this is not, this is one particular kind of murder mystery. Right? So it's not telegraphic. P.D. James is very much along the lines of Elizabeth George. She, she very much weaves an atmosphere so you learn all about all of the characters and there's nothing telegraphic or journalistic about it at all it's very atmospheric but if you like that it's scarcely ever done better than by this author so so i, I happen to like that quite a bit and original sin is I'm one of the only pd james i think um uh, unsuitable job for a woman and of course death comes to pemberley are there's only a handful of pd james that i actually reread and Original Sin is the, at the front of that list. I, I, so it has to be the bean of the batch this time around. It absolutely has to. But that is it. That is your daily, or your, your, I'm not daily. I'm not going to do these every day. That's your TBR, TBR. I'll do another one of these on the weekend, I think, just because we should make a stab at trying to catch up. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen, but I'll do that. I'll make, I'll make another one of these this weekend. Uh, but in the meantime, those are old books for you to reminisce about and maybe... Those of you who are new, it's it's been pointed out to me, and it's a good point, uh, that this these TBR TBRs are not complete navel-gazing on my part. There are thousands of you who weren't here for those original videos. Plain and simple. And there are there are many more of you who were here for those original videos but never thought to keep notes and aren't about to go back. So we will reprise, minus the rants, minus the tags, minus the, the anything like that. We will just reprise the books and talk about them. That could be worthwhile. Certainly, almost every one of these TBR TBRs prompts me to go looking to see if I still have a book. I ought to have the whole shelf of David Quammen, and I don't. Um, I have Death Comes to Pemberley, and I have Original Sin, uh, but I don't know that I have P.D. James's little book on murder mysteries, her nonfiction book on murder mysteries. I don't know if I do or not. Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, that that helps as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.